Tell us the state of uh, play at the moment and how bad things are. Um, hi, Rish. Good morning. Uh, so, yes, things are pretty serious because, as you said, uh, sea level rise is actually mu much worse than many people think. Plus, governments aren't acting. And in Asia, we have a lot of people and very expensive real estate and assets and trade infrastructure located along the coast. And all of this could be at risk. Plus, a reality check is that we've already got to 1.2 degrees Celsius of global warming today compared to the pre-industrial period. And we could be looking at getting to 1.5 degrees C by 2030, which is 70 years ahead of our Paris Agreement target. So obviously, this will bring forward sea level rise, plus new research from the polar regions are showing accelerated melt. So some ice experts actually think we should be looking at three to five meters of sea level rise by 2100. And that's a lot. And that's even without storm surges from typhoons. So if we looked at this three meters and we looked at what does that mean for these 20 large APAC cities? And what we found was that urban real estate equivalent to 22 Singapore's could be permanently lost, which would leave 28 million people homeless and trade infrastructure will be affected. So 20 of the 23 ports and half the airports would be impacted. And this is just from 20 cities, but they're large okay. cities, they're capitals, they're economic hubs. So this is a big impact. Theresa, so that brings me to the ones which are best prepared and the ones which are least prepared for this uh, scenario, if it plays out. Mm -hmm. uh, so, there, so there are 20 cities, obviously, and this is a question that we kept getting asked by investors, banks, corporates, etc. Which cities are most at risk uh, and which are doing are going to be doing better? So we spent our COVID downtime trying to answer this question, and we came up with the CWR APAC 20 index. Um, and we wanted to make sure that it was going to be used by finance. So we got input from over 100 finance uh, experts looking at the different indicators and weightings. And this includes uh, sea level rise risk stacks across different climate scenarios. We looked at storm surge risk, sinking of cities, so subsidence, as well as government action and which governments are doing more, which governments are doing less. So looking at the rankings for looking at both the physical risks as well as government action, at the bottom were Taipei, Macau, Hong Kong, Tokyo, and Nagoya. And at the top were uh, Singapore and Auckland. And that's not saying those cities don't face risks, but it's just, it's all relative because all cities face risks, even if you're not at the coast, right. because your trade infrastructure should be affected. Uh, Darisha, so on the whole, not looking so great. The question is, what can we do about it? And to this end, are property developers taking that into consideration when, when building for the future? So property developers overall are mainly focused at the moment on carbon transition risks and some extreme weather events. But chronic risks from things like sea level rise, although they're recognized, are not really being factored into valuations. And that's because they think, you know, sea level rise by 2100, how's that going to affect valuations today? But that's where they're very wrong. Because obviously, if you have an asset that's going to be stranded by sea level rise by 2100, that asset suddenly becomes an 80-year leasehold asset. Obviously, we would uh, price that very differently to a freehold asset. Typically, it would have a 15 to 25% discount. So we really, we really need this mindset change on thinking about all these long-term risks and how they will affect valuations today. So we need to rethink terminal value calculations. Now, some property developers have started to do these water risk assessments, and they're very quietly and quite smartly started to sell down on some of these assets. I know you're going to ask me for some names, uh, but unfortunately, I can't share that with you right now. Uh, you know, I'm just wondering about valuing water risks. I mean, how should investors look at it? it it's complicated um, because it's very locational. It's interlinked. There's new research coming out every single day. Um, so really, we would say look for an expert because that's what we're there for. And, and then there are a few things you need to do. First is understand this new risk landscape. 
and be very realistic and think about the climate scenarios in a very realistic manner. If we're looking at adaptation, there's no point in a way looking at one and a half degrees Celsius because you're being very, very optimistic. Then you need to start assessing which assets are going to be at risk and, and at, the different, at the different scenarios. Plus, then the third part is having a proper and uh, a, a real uh, strategy in place, one that makes sense which is we need to decarbonize because we can't get to the very dire future we've got ourselves into. Plus we need to adapt because we've already baked in quite a few impacts in already. So we need to think about, you know, where can you invest? How do you change your investment portfolios? How do you adapt to this new future? There's so many conundrums here, and you know, it is a crisis, and with a crisis comes an opportunity as well. Give us an idea of some of the opportunities for, let's say, uh, banks, investment, etc. So, uh, to avoid Atlantis in a way, there are two things we need to do one is to decarbonize, and two is to adapt. On the decarbonization side, um, just renewable energy. Clean tech will lead to at least $16 trillion of investment by 2030. But renewable energy alone is not enough to help us get to carbon neutrality. So we'll need to do a lot more than that. And then on the adaptation front as well, there's a lot that needs to be done. So Singapore has already said it will ha have to spend about $100 billion by 2100. Jakarta has a couple of projects in place that they'll have to spend about $70 billion. Ports in, in Asia will have to spend 50 billion. Airports globally will have to spend $60 billion. So there's a lot, but we need to think slightly outside the box here. When we're looking at seawalls to protect cities, how can we make sure that the cement that goes into that is carbon neutral? Uh, and then how about uh, food security and energy security? It's not just about protecting the coastline, but we need to think slightly differently as well, because all of this will be affected by climate change.